Dr. David Souchin is the Executive Director of the Prairie Adaptation Research Collaborative, which studies climate change and adaptation on the prairies. He has been Professor of Geography at the University of Regina since 1983. His research is collaborative with a variety of agencies. Dave has, an active, ha, Dave has been an active member of Bread of Life Lutheran Church uh, since moving to Regina in early 1983. His bio says he is a regular speaker at community industry and scientific meetings. What I heard for the grapevine is that he's a world-renowned climate scientist. Dr. Mary Vetter uh, is recently retired from a professorship at Luther College at the University of Regina, where she taught biology and interdisciplinary studies since 1984. Currently, she is writing Facile 7 of the Flora of Saskatchewan and conducted paleobotanical research during her career. Mary has been an active member of Bread of Life Lutheran Church since moving to Regina in early 1983. More than one a person shared to me while we were planning this convention that Mary has presented on faith and science in Regina congregations and that these presentations have been very well received. We are thrilled to have two people rooted in science, faith, and the Lutheran tradition to lead us through our reflection and conversation on journey of reconciliation with creation. Please welcome David Souchin and Mary Vetter. Thanks, Paul, for that introduction. And uh, thanks for inviting us to initiate this discussion of reconciliation with creation. This photograph is a special piece of creation. It's, um, excuse me, <clears throat> southwestern Saskatchewan as seen from the Cypress Hills. And I, I took this photo at sunrise and it's obviously in the fall, so it was a bit nippy that morning. Um, but not as nippy as it used to be. I'll, I'll come back to that. Here's another amazing piece of creation. This is Mount Aconcagua on the border between Chile and Argentina. It's the highest elevation in the Western Hemisphere. It's in the Andes. There's no mountain in the Western Hemisphere that's higher than that. And you can hike, you can hike to the top of Mount Aconcagua. It takes a while. I haven't done it, but I talk to people who have. It takes about a couple of weeks to get to the top. And when you get to the, to the summit of Mount Aconcagua, you are actually halfway through the atmosphere in terms of the mass of air. I mean, the atmosphere is hundreds and hundreds of kilometers thick, but most of the air is in the bottom of the atmosphere. Gravity acts on the air. And so as you go up through the atmosphere by hiking or by driving or in an airplane, the air gets thinner and thinner because fairly quickly you lose most of the air. The, the atmosphere is remarkably thin this is a, uh, a photo taken from space, and just by virtue of the position of the sun and the refraction of the light, you get a sense that the atmosphere is a very thin envelope of gases that circumscribes our, our Earth. And yet, this is where we put our waste. We put our waste in the water, in the air. Any process by which we produce gas, like combustion, that we release the gases into the atmosphere. And starting a couple hundred years ago, people began to burn coal and then gas and natural gas and oil. And the combustion of fossil fuels produces carbon dioxide. And as a result, we have changed the chemistry of the atmosphere. And carbon dioxide and other gases are heat trapping gases. And as a result of the way in which we've changed the composition of the atmosphere, the Earth is getting warmer. Here's about the strongest indication of that. This is the average temperature of the entire Earth back to 1880. It's every month back to 1880. 
And if it was a cold month, it's in blue. And if it's a warm month, it's in red. We define that in terms of what's called a temperature anomaly. Anomaly just means difference. If you're anomalous, it means you're a different type of person. So a temperature anomaly is either below average in blue or above average in red. And you can see that starting in the middle of the 20th century, some years began to be warmer than average. And then beginning in the early 1980s, every single month has been warmer and warmer than average. And as a result, this past month was the 414th consecutive month with temperatures above the 20th century average. So this is a very, and this is, this is temperature data. It's the same data you consult when you look at the weather forecast. It's from thermometers. Thermometers at thousands of locations all over the world, and it's showing that the Earth is getting warmer. Now, it's interesting. It's interesting to scientists. Scientists find this interesting. The media finds it interesting. But actually, this information is pretty useless. You can't actually use this information for any purpose because the temperature of the whole world doesn't actually exist. It's a statistical concept. You can't find the temperature of the whole world on a weather forecast. You can't feel the temperature of the whole world. When you consult the weather app on your phone or you turn on the radio, you want to know the temperature where you live. And so let's look and see what's happening with temperatures where we live or pretty close to Regina. Let's go about an hour down the Trans-Canada Highway to Indian Head, Saskatchewan. Because at Indian Head, they've been measuring temperatures back to 1892 without missing a single day. It's a pretty remarkable temperature record. And this isn't any temperature record. This is the daily winter minimum temperature. Okay, so this is the lowest temperature that we experience because it's in winter and because it's in the morning. So when you get up in the morning in winter and you get out and scrape the ice off your car, that's the lowest temperatures we get every day and in the winter because the earth has been cooling through the night. And you might notice that the minimum temperature has been going up and up and up. Now it varies a lot from year to year because in Saskatchewan we have an incredibly variable climate. We have one of the most variable climates on earth. I think it's southern Saskatchewan, North Dakota, and somewhere in Mongolia because you can't get any further away from the oceans. The oceans have a very much have a moderating effect on our weather and that's why we go to places like Victoria or Vancouver because you can expect to get reasonable weather. You don't know what the weather's going to be in Saskatchewan. It's all over the place. But if we compare, sorry, if we compare the average of the first 30 years to the most recent 30 years, that's what these lines represent, then the average minimum winter temperature has gone from about 23 degrees, nope, 24 degrees, halfway in between 23 and 20, 25. It's gone from about 24 degrees to 19 degrees. That's an increase of five degrees in the minimum temperature, which is huge. Because at one point in the Earth's history, the temperature dropped by five degrees and a glacier formed and covered all of Canada. So an equivalent temperature change in the other direction produced a glacier that covered the entire country of Canada except the Cypress Hills. And we're talking about in the last hundred years, the temperature in southern Saskatchewan in winter has gone up by five degrees. Which Sounds pretty exciting, actually. Who's going to complain about warmer winters? But it does have a lot of implications for ecosystems and for water, because if the winter keeps warming, we'll no longer have snow. We'll have rain instead. And, you know, a warmer winter is, sounds pretty nice, but it's also nice for diseases, pests, pests, 
invasive species, and these kinds of nasty things are beginning to show up in our part of the world because they're surviving our warmer winters. Just uh, another indication that our winters are getting warmer, if you go right off to the far end of the curve, if you go off to the right-hand side, that's the winter we just had. And we whined and complained about this winter. We thought this winter was terribly cold. Well, if you compare this winter to the last 120 or 140 winters, it was actually warmer than average. Now, if you're less than 30 years old, you just experienced a cold winter. But if you're more than 30 years old, think about back in the day, winters were actually much, much colder. So the strongest indication that global warming is affecting our part of the world is our climate is getting much less cold. It's not getting any hotter or much hotter in summer. It's getting much less cold in winter. And something else is going on, and this is the last bit of science I'll give you. I'm taking my full semester climate change course and reducing it down to five slides. <laughs> something else is going on, and that's our precipitation. Because most of our water comes from the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean is just to the west here a couple thousand kilometers, and that's the source of nearly all our water. The Pacific Ocean is 16 times larger than Canada. And it's getting warmer, because most of the extra heat that we're producing is going into the oceans. Three quarters of the Earth is ocean, and water stores a lot of heat. So global warming is changing the process by which the Pacific Ocean produces humidity and storms that eventually arrive in Western Canada. So we are changing the intensity and the timing of our precipitation and our water supply. And that's probably the most profound effect that global warming will have in our part of the world because, of course, we depend so much on rainfall and snowmelt, more so than the rest of Canada. So there's a little bit of climate science. And a last message here is the extent of the change in our climate is going to depend on how much more we modify the atmosphere. And here's three possibilities. Starting in blue, this blue trajectory assumes that we will get our act together and control the production of greenhouse gases. That's unrealistic. It's not going to happen. The brown scenario suggests that perhaps by the middle of this century, we will have controlled the production of greenhouse gases, and that's the amount of warming, maybe warming topping out at four degrees. But the more plausible scenario is the trajectory that we're actually on. That red trajectory is the path that we are following in terms of producing greenhouse gases, and it's going to result in two degrees of warming within a couple decades from now, and by the end of the century, we're looking at enormous amounts of global warming. So somehow we have to get off that red trajectory because the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said that two degrees of warming around the world is dangerous. That's two degrees for the whole world. Canada is warming at twice that rate, and Western Canada is warming at three times the global rate. So we're talking about six degrees of warming in Western Canada by the middle of this century if we remain on that trajectory that's shown here in red. So the rest of my talk and everything Mary talks about is the basis for a discussion of how we get off this trajectory and how we got on it in the first place. The simple answer, and much too simple, is the growth in the population of the entire world. So this uh, graph shows in blue the increase in population. And if you go back to, say, 1952, the year I was born, you'll see that the population of the Earth has gone from about 3 million, or 2.5 million, sorry, 2.5 billion. These are thousands of millions, which is billions. 
around early 1950s, about two and a half billion. By 2000, it was six billion. And now, it's almost 7.7 .7 billion. So for most of us, the population of the Earth has more than tripled in our lifetime. But that's not the simple, that's not the total answer. It's more nuanced than that. And that's why this graph includes, in brown, the rate at which we have produced carbon dioxide. And notice that if you go back 100 years or further, there's a gap between the population and the carbon dioxide. But then that gap begins to narrow until by the 1950s, the post-war, there's a rapid decrease in the gap between the population and the carbon dioxide emissions. The carbon dioxide emissions are actually increasing more rapidly than the population. How does that happen? Well, each of us is producing a lot more carbon dioxide than we used to. Each of us has been using a lot more energy than we did back in the day. Do you remember when there used to be a concept of the family car? Every family had one car. People used buses. People walked back in the day. We would shower or bath maybe once or twice a week. We just have a much greater energy consumptive and water consumptive lifestyle. And now the rest of the world is emulating our lifestyle. So a lot of the increase in energy use is not necessarily in the developed world, but in the, in the rest of the world. And you can't blame those people. I and mean, we've, we've enjoyed this lavish lifestyle for most of our lives. Why shouldn't the rest of the world enjoy it as well? And so really, it's the per capita consumption of energy and the per capita production of greenhouse gases. And does anybody know the place in the world that produces the most greenhouse gases per person? It's actually Wyoming. There's half a million people in Wyoming. But number two is Saskatchewan. No place else in the world except Wyoming produces more greenhouse gases. And it's because we have a small population and we use coal to produce electricity. And we don't have much in terms of public transportation. Okay, so that is pretty much the reason that our climate is changing. And I just lost, I don't want to look at myself, please. So here we have Refinery Row outside of Edmonton. I grew up about five blocks from there. And um, as a result of this rapid industrialization, since post-Second World War, it's created a lot of wealth and it's created lots of luxury. So we have our wealth and luxury. We pretty much have greenhouse gases and fossil fuels to thank. And people suggest, well, if it's technology that's created this problem, maybe the solution lies in technology. So here's a wind farm in southern Alberta. And sure, that's part of the answer. Part of the answer is green energy. but it's not the total solution. We can't rely entirely on technologies that, are, that no, not, don't yet exist or have yet to replace the use of fossil fuels. We can't rely on science and technology. Science is a small part of the solution. Science actually is very narrow in scope in terms of how we see the world. Scientists can only study what we can measure. So here's a cloud producing rain, and I've converted the rain into ones and zeros because that's how the data is stored in a computer. But the information is pretty much meaningless without some kind of context. So this is a study where we studied rain in Saskatchewan. And we used it to inform agriculture and small communities like Rush Lake. So that was the context. In other words, scientists are great at producing data and information, but it's pretty much useless without some kind of context 
and some kind of understanding of what it means. So we can only go from data to information to knowledge without that social and economic context. And science will never get us to the state of wisdom. We need some other way of knowing. We need some other way of understanding the world other than science to achieve wisdom. So really, when it comes down to it, climate change is much more than a scientific problem. Science, sorry, climate change is a social problem, and it's a spiritual problem, and it's a social justice problem. Because we need wisdom to tackle it, and science doesn't give us wisdom. It only gives us data and information. Here's one, one more example of that. At our lab, our lab is right across the street here. You're welcome to visit any time. In our lab, we've produced weather forecasts for the year 2042. So here's a weather forecast from the 1st of April to the end of May for 2042. Pretty amazing, eh? We have computer models that can produce these plausible, we can't possibly know the future, but based on our understanding of the climate, we produce these weather forecasts. But it's just a bunch of numbers. It doesn't mean anything without some kind of context and here's the context. People, communities, in this case, some ranchers. We took a group of students to visit this ranch because the ranchers told us if the kind of weather that we predict was to occur, how would it affect their ranch, how would it affect cattle production, and how would it affect their community? This is my last slide before I turn things over to Mary. <clears throat> the fundamental problem is we're telling one another a reassuring lie. We're telling each other that technology will take care of it. It won't. We're telling each other that the problem is not as serious as it seems. Not true. We are all in passive denial. You know, we love to complain about climate deniers, but in fact, we're all in denial. And it's going to take some kind of way of understanding, some other way of knowing other than science to put us on a trajectory whereby we can lessen our impact on the world, on the atmosphere, and on creation. So I'm going to turn things over to Mary, and she can lead that kind of discussion. Well, <laughs> so one of the goals of these reconciliation discussions through the convention is to have you start thinking or continue thinking about how you will bring this conversation back, such as the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, the complexity of reconciliation is displayed in the steps they identified. Awareness of the past, acknowledgement of the harm that has been inflicted, atonement for the causes, and action to change behavior. And certainly, pursuing reconciliation with creation is similarly challenging. As Dave pointed out, science on the right opens the door with knowledge, enumeration, analysis, and lists of possible actions. But as Dave said, science itself cannot give us the wisdom for reconciliation. We need, for example, scripture, faith, empathy, experience, scholarship across all disciplines. And it's not hard to identify some of the barriers to reconciliation. You talked about a lot of those in your discussions. It may be costly in many ways, and it will challenge how we define a good life. It's human nature to discount the future in favor of the present. 
We may not even recognize climate change. We already live in one of the most variable climates on Earth. As Dave said, how are we even really going to see it? And in contrast to the most vulnerable people elsewhere, we are insulated from the negative impacts of climate change by our wealth, our governments, and our institutions. Home insurance doesn't even exist in most of the world. So how can we work towards reconciliation given these barriers? In his book, Earth Honoring Faith, Religious Ethics in a New Key, Larry Rasmussen says that the critical first step, sorry, I even got behind, I forgot to flip the slide. <laughs> And the, the critical first step is to see afresh by finding, and I quote, another place to stand with other possibilities for seeing, understanding, and responding. Another place to stand, like on thin ice, a fish out of water, perhaps going to a place we aren't quite prepared or want to be. But using the steps identified by the TRC, we can explore some examples of finding other places to stand when we look at the task or the path of reconciliation. So step one, awareness. The challenge is that awareness is deeper than knowledge. Cynthia Molabita, in her book, Resisting Structural Evil, Love as Economic Ecological Vocation, says, I believed that if the people of my country simply knew what was on the other end of their material wealth, their consumption patterns would change. But merely knowing, I learned, was not enough. The chains that bind us into systemic exploitation of others and of the earth are intricate and cleverly hidden. Kairos, a consortium of Canadian churches and religious organizations, suggests that while often humans have tended to put ourselves at the center, and when you think about it, Christianity has often been accused of doing that putting humans at the center. But Cairo says, we believe that the world as God's handiwork has its own inherent worth and value. After each act in the first creation story, God saw that it was good. Following God's lead, we value creation in its own right caring for it as would God its creator. This teaching calls for a change in worldview, moving us outside of the center and letting us acknowledge the harm we have done. And the challenge is that we haven't valued everything. Full cost accounting, here using business language, means tallying all the costs and benefits, tangible and intangible, numbers and values, present and future, nearby and global. Paraphrasing Kairos, petroleum energy is subsidized and its low cost doesn't account for real external costs resulting in wastefulness, and it produces dependence on that cheap oil. The struggle to control oil supplies and production has resulted in massive human deaths elsewhere in the world, terrible conflicts, awful human rights abuses. It's overwhelming to try to acknowledge the full costs of petroleum. Where do we start? or of any problem with creation. But as Bishop Susan says in, her, in Sunday's sermon, we have a practice of standing in a place of humility, acknowledging things known and unknown, done and left undone. Our corporate confession reads in part, 
Have mercy on us for self-centered living, for failing to walk with humility and gentleness, for unwillingness to see the image of God in others, for reluctance in sharing the gifts of creation and the gifts of God, for carelessness with the fruits of creation. And it is, of course, what follows confession that emboldens us to acknowledge the harm without fear. Your sins are forgiven. The fear is gone and gives us the determination and the possibility of working towards atonement. But the challenge is, it's really very hard to know how to atone. What really can make a difference? Once again, Cynthia Molobita helps us find another place to stand. And I quote, my purpose, rather than breeding guilt, is to nourish moral, spiritual power for imagining, recognizing, forging, and adopting ways of life that build equity among human beings and a sustainable relationship between us and our world. How can we nourish moral spiritual power? Well, we can form communities that strengthen us and to which we are accountable. For example, putting children at the center makes us accountable for the future, right then and there. We're accountable. Canadian Lutheran World Relief brings us into community with people, the most vulnerable people around the world. The very practice of atonement translates into a deeper relationship with God, with our neighbors, ourselves, and all creation. The question changes profoundly from what we should do to what we're free with forgiveness and love to want to do. In other words, step four, action. But perhaps the biggest challenge here is that we enjoy and we even tend to define our well-being in terms of consumption. In her book, Blessed Are the Consumers, provocative title if there ever was one, Blessed Are the Consumers, Climate Change and the Practice of Restraint, Sally McFaig misses no words. Three factors account for the world's most serious problems, population, technology, and consumption. Now we have to be very careful how we frame the population part. Children are one of God's greatest gifts. And if we're honest, if we bemoan population growth, what we really mean is they have too many babies. They have too many babies. I used to show a film called The Population Time Bomb in my class until one of my students came up and she said, how can you show that film? Don't you realize the imagery? It's too many brown babies. That's what they're showing in that film. I never used it again. It's kind of slow. The reality, though, is on average, a child born here will consume 40 to 50 times as many resources as a child in a poorer country. So one action we can do is to share and teach values of restraint with our children and grandchildren. Turning to technology, it surely has brought us many gifts, but it can also encourage consumption. More efficient cars since the 1970s, and now we just drive more. The bottom line, the very crux of the problem, is that we feel we've earned the right to consumption. And governments threaten that at their peril. 
I mean, just listen to the electioneering on TV right now. It focuses on threats to our right to consumption, i.e. taxes, like a carbon tax, right? It's threatening the money we have to do other stuff. We don't want it. Quoting former U.S. President George W. Bush, encouraging a country shaken by 9-11, get down to Disney World in Florida, take your families and enjoy life the way we want, add, deserve it to be enjoyed. So much so that recently geologists have proposed a new geologic time period, the Anthropocene. Now, a new time period in the geological framework is a really big deal. We're talking about stuff like the extinction of the dinosaurs. What the Anthropocene definition says is, humans are now the dominant force on Earth, shown as exponential rises in every single measure of consumption. Beginning about 1950 is when the curve starts to go up. Energy use, water use, fertilizer use, pollution, on and on. Like it or not, we are already standing in a different place where we've never been before. Maybe reconciliation means considering carefully every single thing we do or buy. The government of Bhutan admittedly perhaps to stifle dissent, has formulated the gross national happiness philosophy, a holistic definition of ha happiness that includes, for example, cultural diversity and resilience, community viability. But we must avoid the arrogance of thinking they in Bhutan and others in other similarly poor countries should be satisfied with what they already have. Kind of like looking at migrant holding centers and saying it's better than where they came from, and we recognize where that came from. But in this recent study, comparing happiness among nations, GDP, the purple part on the left is only one factor. Perhaps wants can be reshaped and even needs can be redefined. We really are blessed with a place to stand in God's love, even in the midst of complexity and confusion. We are aware that all of creation is God's work in love. And we acknowledge through confession that individually and collectively we have not always treated it that way. Forgiveness frees and empowers us to strive for atonement and seek the moral, spiritual power that will transform our actions. Again, in Bishop's sermon, the path to reconciliation is based on truth, love, humility, justice, forgiveness, in other words, the very essence of our faith. We ask you who sing creation's story to empower us to take the path of reconciliation with creation. Thank you. <laughs>